Good afternoon, conference. Uh, I'm extremely grateful for the invitation to talk to you today. I'm actually hoping this is the last time a Home Office civil servant will address you about the College of Policing. For all of the good that we do, um, in, in very short order, there will be some very visible leadership for the College, a chair and a chief executive. So in the meantime, I've been asked, I'm kind of the understudy, um, I've been the programme director for the transition of the National Policing Improvement Agency over the last 12 months, and uh, I'm now the director of policing. But as part of that transition, we've been moving staff into successor bodies, the Home Office, the National Crime Agency, uh, a new IT company, and also setting up uh, the College of Policing. So in a sense, I have a good sense of where we are, and I'm hoping I'll be able to share some of that with you today. Um, what I want to cover today is, uh, is a bit about why it's needed, what the key differences are that the college will bring to the existing landscape, um, the objectives of the college, and just to give you, s I want to give you some of the factual details of our plans and where they've got to. Um, before I do that, I actually just want to pay tribute to Derek Barnett and Ar Irene Curtis for their involvement around the College of Policing. We've been meeting pretty much monthly in something called the Developing Professionalism Working Group, which the Minister has been chairing. And Derek and Irene have been absolutely brilliant, incredibly constructive, um, mostly reminding me and my team how we're just sounding a bit too much like bureaucrats and have lost sight of the opportunity that the College presents. So they, they really have been feeding your views um, into the design of the College. So, why is it needed? Um, uh, you've been hearing today all of the things that I think are said to you a lot, that threats are more sophisticated, um, that the financial challenge requires policing to improve its services to the public whilst delivering uh, savings. I think one of the big things um, about policing is that 80% of your spend is spent on your staff. So how you use your staff and what they know um, and what they're doing in the field is incredibly important and that's what the college is there to do. Um, the Home Secretary, in her speech, emphasised that officers will be free to cut crime based on your professional judgement. And again, for me, the College is all about making sure that that professional judgement is, um, is at the core of design around guidance, around policy, um, around training, uh, so that um, professional judgement is at the heart of policing. Um, so, I, I, I think the College uh, represents four changes. I'm just going to skip through to this. And, and this, is, this is not a government narrative. This is what I think is different about the college compared to the National Policing Improvement Agency that went before. So the first thing is that the college has an exclusive focus on professionalism. The MPIA um, had a pretty big and broad brief. And I think there's a huge benefit to just focusing on professionalism. And that's what the college will do. Um, the second thing is a change in governance. Um, I think governance is not one of those things that gets your heart racing, but as we all know, a change in boss often changes what you do in the workplace. And so a change in governance of the college is going to make a big difference to the way that uh, these services and um, policy and guidance are done. And the change in governance is um, to ensure that the public interest is put in, so we have a significant independent contingent on the board uh, with uh, PCCs as part of that. And also that the policing interest is there. And it's not just ACPO who are representing that. It's also that police superintendents, police uh, at federated ranks and staff will be sitting on the board. And I think that inclusivity is a huge change to where we are right now. The third thing is I think it will have a much closer um, relationship with academia. The Home Secretary talked earlier about the college forging links with universities and wanting to identify and implement best practice of what works. Um, I hope the college is going to be much more directive of academic research that's going on in, in universities, and those partnerships that she described will get uh, built on and coordinated a lot better by the College of Policing. But also, I hope the college is going to be more encouraging of police officers and staff doing their own research and getting it published, uh, published and peer-reviewed so that all of that contributes to the body of evidence that informs what you're doing um, as police officers. And then the fourth change is uh, uh, increased connection to national business area work, which currently sits under ACPO. And this is one of the areas that's under discussion at present. We've got a lot clearer about what we think this is going to look like. 
um, ACPO have agreed that relevant national business area work will fall under the governance of the college. And those areas are those which are about national standards for operational policing, um, policy guidance, professional practice, the training curriculum, um, the assessment pathways for promotion and progression. But also those areas which are about enabling excellence in operational policing practice. So um, around uh, making sure that the right capability is built in forces and shaping operational requirements. Um, so uh, Hugh w was using an example with me earlier about public order. The tactics for public order, the standards for um, how people should be trained, to what standard people should be trained in a public order situation would be set by the college, but it's for the um, chief's council and for chief constables as a whole to decide how many um, public order uh, trained staff are going to be available. So there's a split between policy and operations. The Chief's Council is an important part of the governance. Um, the Chief's Council, of course, is separate, uh, but it will have a very significant relationship to the College of Policing because the College of Policing will be consulting with the Chiefs to make sure that the policy and guidance that they're agreeing can be implemented and it is financially affordable. Um, and also, it will be for the Chiefs to implement what the College agrees at the end of the day. So all of this uh, means that these are the objectives that we've agreed for the college. And this is the, the work that Irene and others have been heavily involved in, in trying to come up with something that's, that uh, is clear about what the, the college is trying to do. So we've said it's going to safeguard the public and support the fight against crime by ensuring professionalism in policing. That's its absolute core mission. We put protect the public interest at the top. Um, and we've talked about enhancing national standards uh, identifying evidence of what works. We've, we felt that there was perhaps a bit too much direction going on originally. It was all about setting standards and uh, making sure everyone was excellent. So we wanted to put in something about supporting the education and professional development of officers and staff. And then the last objective is making reference actually to that national business area work, which is about ensuring that people can work closely together. I'm going to leave those up there whilst I just carry on and say a little bit more. Um, I wanted, uh, I spoke earlier about the context for policing and the challenges that are constantly changing for you. Um, and it's you and your frontline colleagues that have to face those challenges. And you need to feel empowered to tackle these with the support of, of your professional body. Um, I see the college as having a very fundamental role in two areas. One is around reducing bureaucracy. Um, the college will be setting guidance and, and uh, setting standards, and it needs to make sure that it does those with an eye to whether that's creating unnecessary bureaucracy. The second area is about enhancing professional discretion. Um, the Office of Constable requires use of knowledge, it requires use of judgment, and the college needs to be upholding that and supporting that as you go forward. What the college won't be doing, and there have been a number of myths that have been out there, but I just want to lay these to rest. It, it, at the start, it certainly won't be issu issuing a licence to practice. I know there are some people in the policing community who think it should. That's not the intention at present. Uh, we don't think it should duplicate roles that any other body plays. So, for instance, it doesn't need to investigate complaints or allegations of misconduct because the IPCC is there to do that. Um, and we also don't think it will create a raft of bureaucratic guidance. That's absolutely the opposite of what it should be doing. In terms of uh, where we are with the transition from the National Policing Improvement Agency into the college, we've now identified which staff are going to be moving in. There's around 600 of them. Quite a lot of them are seconded police officers. Um, it, it will be taking with, us its, with it its key products that you know at, and perhaps love at the moment, the Strategic Command Course, High Potential Development Scheme, Polka, and a number of others. Um, and although it will probably look quite similar at the start to what you know from the MPIA, once the leadership is in as, and is getting much clearer about what the offer will be from the college to professionals, that will start to change. Some things, I suspect, won't change, like the Strategic Command Course, but it will be up to the, the board of the college to decide um, how to take that strategy forward. Um, we've, we're hoping to advertise this week for the chief executive. We've already advertised for the chair, and we're in the middle of recruiting that. And the other thing I just want to mention is that at the start, the college will be a company limited by guarantee, wholly owned by the Secretary of State. That's intended just to be a transitional arrangement so that we can um, get going with setting up a college and start that journey towards a, an independent body. 
In the long run, we want to set up an independent statutory body, and we, we plan to do that as soon as parliamentary time allows. And that will enable the Home Office to get out of the way of the College and enable the College to be much more independent. Um, we're in the middle of uh, preparing the policy work around that statutory body, so I'd, be, I'd welcome any um, insights, comments that you might have as to what we should be paying attention to as we pe prepare that statute. So just to sum up, really, the College is a real opportunity. Superintendents have already been heavily involved, and this is another opportunity for, for you to um, have your say. You will be able to be involved going forward because of your role on the board and because this College will be there to serve your work. Um, I hope that the College will make a difference to you as policing professionals. I look forward to the conversation afterwards. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Proof of thought there, I'm sure. And um, we'll come to questions a little bit later. Right now, uh, Ed Boyd from Policy Exchange. Ed, come and join us, please. Thank you very much. He's going to talk about uh, police and crime commissioners. Well, hi, it's great to have the uh, opportunity to speak with you all today. Uh, thank you uh, for that. And it's great to have the opportunity to talk about what the future policing landscape may hold under police and crime commissioners, uh, especially considering just how much is changing uh, in such a short space of time. So often when um, uh, big, significant changes are happening in the way that public services are run, we are able to have the benefit of looking back into the past uh, and seeing some of the similar change that was made and learn from that what the possible consequences might be. We don't have this luxury with police and crime commissioners. Uh, they are, despite what some may say, uh, a first, and no other country has been uh, as bold to introduce such a reform. Instead, much of the story about police and crime commissioners were, uh, uh, and, and what the effect will be on policing is yet to be written. Most of it, though, will be penned by two characters, the public uh, and yourselves. Firstly, and most importantly, the public will choose who their police and crime commissioner will be in each area, and that will make a difference. Secondly, though, the police will have a significant say in how well life with PCCs work, depending on how they react to their appointment and how they welcome them into the force. But putting these two overriding factors to the side for one moment, I want to outline three ways in which I think a good PCC who is well supported will be able to improve policing in their police force and thereby shape the future policing landscape for the better. They are as follows. I think they can create a better structure for fighting crime and disorder. I think they should be the police's strongest advocate and it will give the, uh, the public a louder voice in the setting of police priorities. Firstly, a better structure for fighting crime. Now, when any change is being made, there's one question that we've got to ask ourselves. What difference will this make to the public? In this case, what difference will the introduction of police and crime commissioners make to the reduction of crime and disorder and the increasing of public confidence? And I truly believe and want to argue that the dual role that these uh, individuals will be taking on to hold the police accountable, but also themselves being accountable for the level of crime in their area, enables them to, if they fulfill their role properly, have a great structure for, fight, for the fight against crime and disorder. Allow me to explain. In 2010, when Theresa May uh, became Home Secretary, uh, she, uh, she uh, said the following, which you might well remember. I couldn't be clearer about your mission. It isn't a 30-point plan. It is to cut crime, no more, no less. Now, to the outside observer, this is a very clear mission statement. No more policing pledge, no more output-based performance metrics. Instead, a single-minded focus on tackling crime. Yet, whilst this mission might be clear, it is far from straightforward, for there are many ways that one can go about cutting crime, and the central role the police play overlaps the wider responsibility of police partners. There have been numerous strategies over the time to talk about how the police should get involved in this fight against crime. There have been direct strategies that have been put forward in activities, such as hotspot policing that argued that the police should target their police patrol on high crime areas and times when that crime is li most likely to take place. Then there are more indirect strategies that have been put forward as the best way of doing things, such as broken windows theory, which argued that we need to tackle the underlying uh, causes of crime first, or problem-orientated policing, which said we should focus on behavioural issues that led to crime. Now, both these direct and indirect methods of preventing crime and disorder and tackling it make up the tapestry of what we call modern policing today. The extreme indirect activities, such as uh, taking ex-offenders on fishing trips or blue light discos, are often lambasted by the media um, 
uh, and who have a go at the police for not having a single focused, a single minded focus on crime. Yet, these do play a part, however small, in the fight against reducing crime. The question is not so much whether they attack crime, but whether it's legitimate for the police to be doing them. There was a poll that the Police Federation did in 2010, uh, which showed that just 9% of the public believed that helping to run youth clubs and other community activities was the role of the police. 58% believed it to be the role of the local council. The police do play the central role in cutting crime, but not all of the factors that affect crime fall under the police's remit. And this is my main point. They do fall under the remit of a police and crime commissioner. A good police and crime commissioner who understands this should be able to see when the responsibility should fall on the police and when the responsibility should fall on police partners, be it individuals, communities, other government organisations or private businesses. We have a paper coming out later this year that's going to look at what the future of policing could be in 2020. As part of this, we sent out a, a questionnaire to, uh, to chief constables just to gauge their feelings on some of these matters. One of the statements that we put to them and asked them if they agreed with it was the following. Preventing crime and disorder from occurring cannot be the prime responsibility of police forces as it is affected by too many of the factors outside of police control. Two thirds so far have agreed with this statement. A practical example of this uh, will be car crime. So between 1995 and 2010, it reduced 45%. Back in 95, it was one in every five crimes. Yet in 2010, it was just 11%. The reason why this crime was reduced was largely a result of innovations in the automobile industry, such as the invention of uh, immobilizers and things like that. It's my hope that when a PCC uh, comes into power, they will not only recognize that they have this wide responsibility, but that they will act on it to ensure that, the, and this will ensure, hopefully, that their role for the first time will allow a sensible and effective approach to crime prevention. The second point I want to make is interrelated with this, and it's that I think the police, um, as long as the PCC does their role properly, will have a strong advocate. For by increasing the influence of those charged with holding the police accountable, Police forces also have increased the strength of those who should be their greatest advocate. I believe the current lack of a powerful individual who can put pressure on police partners who are failing to do their duties professionally and hold, holding their responsibilities subsequently undermines the fight against crime and has caused significant issues. It's led to the mentality in some cases of the police being treated like a junk drawer of societal need that where if in doubt the police should be called regardless of whether it is their responsibility. Taking an example of this, uh, in 2009-10, uh, Cheshire Constabulary did some work to try and work out where their demand for missing people was coming from. They found that in that year, they had around 3,500 missing people at a cost of £3.3 million, excluding the cost of crime committed while those people were missing or on them. They found, perhaps unsurprisingly, that 77% of this demand came from children's care homes. What they also found as well was that a small number of individuals and a small number of care homes were creating the majority of this demand. Two and a half percent of the individuals created a quarter of the uh, missing report alerts. And individual homes were responsible for up to and over 100 missing people reports per year. Yet, despite the obvious benefits in this case for proactive intervention, uh, within the care home to make sure that the chance of people running away and the, the resultant cost on the police and society and to those individuals themselves, they found there was not much proactive intervention going on inside whatsoever. Instead, there was almost a feeling of over-reliance on the police. The police were being called if the uh, individual was 10 minutes late for a meeting. Yet, this, this is despite receiving upwards of 12K a year to look after each individual. Ofsted have a role in this to uh, hold them to account in their approach to missing people, but from the police's perspective, it seemed as though they were doing this poorly. This is something that should be very much in the domain of a PCC, in, ter in terms of being the advocate for the police force to make sure that they are well supported by partners as they lead the charge in the fight against crime and disorder. In our, um, as, uh, yeah, as PCCs take on their new role, it will be their responsibility to ensure that police partners take up um, that role and make sure that they, them and their partners can work effectively together. They should be advocating for the police to make sure that they do not have other responsibilities dropped upon them. Indeed, they even have a vested interest to do so, for they themselves will be held accountable uh, next time the elections come up for the way that they tackle and look to tackle crime. 
So what does this mean for superintendents? I believe that this should mean that if you have a PCC that you know will advocate for you in such circumstances, new opportunities should be opened up. Where you've had scenarios previously where you've been hitting a brick wall time and time again with police partners, things should change. Even better, if the situation allows and you're able to provide robust data that shows this to be the case, the PCC should have everything that they need to ensure that police partners are doing their job properly, which will enable you to do yours. The final point I want to make is that the public will have a louder voice in policing. And just look at some of the consequences of this. By replacing police authorities with a directly elected representative in your police and crime, the police and crime commissioner, who will have the power to set priorities, the voice of the public will be increased. The public voice will be different from force to force because in different areas, people have different priorities. But more generally, I think there is one thing that the public are likely to push for, and the polls very much point towards this, and it's this, more visible policing. There was a Times poll done earlier this year, for example, that showed that 76% uh, of the public wanted more visible policing. Therefore, I think it's very much likely that there's going to be a push for this to increase. This will have two distinct effects, I think, one more certain than the other. Firstly, it should increase public confidence and reduce fear of criminal activity. There is substantial evidence from HMIC in 2002 and 2011 and academics such as Thorpe and Slogan that public confidence increases as policing becomes more visible. There's a second effect, though, which is less certain. And how profound the effect uh, greater visible policing has on reducing crime and disorder will depend significantly on how this public priority is implemented. It will depend upon the actions that you decide to take reacting to this public priority. For this is very much a part of the police's role at, uh, as part of their operational independence. If it is implemented as a tick box activity, where police forces simply recall the number of hours that officers are visible and available to the public, I think we will have missed a trick. Visibility, visible policing is a good thing in itself for reducing fear uh, and increasing confidence. But an intelligent approach to what those officers are doing whilst they are visible will maximise the effect of that resource in preventing crime and disorder. I'd like to suggest two uh, distinct ways in which uh, that I think are intelligent approaches to visible policing to maximise this. Firstly is the default single crewing. I know lots of forces have done this, some more so than others. And there are some areas where the risk is obviously high enough that there needs to be double crewing of officers. But in many areas, this isn't the case. We did a poll last year that showed that uh, the public are, believe they are more likely that they see double crewing twice as likely uh, twice as often, sorry, as single crewing. The benefits of single crewing wherever possible are not only just increased visibility, but quite naturally when two people are walking side by side down the road, they are more likely to chat to each other rather than be available as possible to the public that they are uh, policing. Secondly, I believe visible resource, uh, the visible resource should be intelligently targeted. Now there is some evidence that visible policing by itself reduces crime. For example, take uh, after the 7-7 bombings, uh, an academic from LSE called Draka showed that the surge of visible officers from Operation Thesis uh, was accompanied by and likely led to a reduction in crime. Yet there was further, more substantial evidence that targeting some of the resource in high crime hotspots has a more significant effect on reducing crime. I would go so far as to say that I think it is probably the most evidenced uh, the hotspot policing has the most evidence behind it and is the most compelling of any evidence-based policing strategy on reducing crime to date. So my plea would be that the push that is likely to come from PCCs is combined by evidence of what works. And this fits in with what is happening, I think, with the, uh, the, the College of Policing. This isn't to say that we should remove visible officers from areas where there isn't high crime. That would draw officers away from rural areas, undermine public confidence, and take the model of the police away from that which the public want. Instead, we need to be smart about the way in which we use our visible resource. We need to make the most of it, especially in an age of austerity. As I close, I just want to make one final point about how all these changes might alter the world of superintendents, also your world. Um, for I believe one of the indirect consequences of the current reforms will be the formation of a new market for chief constables and senior police leaders. In short, I believe the market for chief constables and senior police leaders will become far more competitive as a result of these reforms. Police and crime commissioners are likely to be active, I think, in the market for the best chief constables. 
If they spot a chief or a potential chief in another force, then there was little stopping them and much encouraging them to try and lure them to their force. As a result, I believe there will be greater opportunities and more competition for new roles than there ever, ever have been previously. To sum up, the future policing landscape, I believe, will be significantly different from that which we experience today. What the future looks like will depend significantly on who gets into power and how they are supported. But a good PCC should see their force benef benefiting from a more holistic approach to crime. Where the police have a strong advocate to push back on partners that aren't upholding their responsibilities. And the public will, for the first time, have a loud voice in the nature of policing in their area. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Um, does everyone share his enthusiasm for police and crime commissioners? Perhaps not. If you don't, uh, store your thoughts and pose them at the end. Right now, Simon Cole, Chief Constable of Leicester. We'll talk about, so. amongst other things, social media, yeah? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, if you want uh, Steve Redgrave to come and talk to you, you have to give him about 10 years' notice. Uh, if you want Ellie Simmons, about five years. So 10 days ago, when Irene tweeted me, I was thrilled to accept her invitation to come and join you this afternoon, uh, of an association, of course, of which I was once a member, albeit I've worked out nine years ago that I was a member of the Superintendents Association, and it's lovely to see uh, some familiar faces uh, from my past and present. Um, I'm going to talk about transparency with the challenge from Irene to take, have a bit of a different take on it. And I guess at the heart of what I'm going to say is something about legitimacy and actually a link with some of what you've heard this afternoon. You've heard the Home Secretary talking about an independent HMIs. You've heard much about PCCs. You've just heard around the College of P Policing and a sense of opening up, to use a phrase the Home Secretary used earlier. And I'm assured that our every move this afternoon is available on YouTube. Um, which may concern you. So, in a session on adapting to the new landscape, I'm not really going to talk about the landscape, I'm going to talk about the climate. Because I think that the transparency agenda is moving probably slightly faster than we're moving, although I would absolutely accept there are lots of things that we're doing that contribute positively to that. And I think that's probably a different... There's some, within this, there's some ways to be visible in a different way to what Ed just talked about. And also, Derek, who I saw sneak in, he's over there, he's changed his clothes to confuse me. Um, Derek said to the Home Secretary, um, not that long ago from this platform, that you are operational leaders and you're not hidden away in offices. Well, actually, I think some of the transparency agenda allows you opportunities to demonstrate that um, and reinforce that point. So. We're going to romp through transparency. It's not started well because the button... Yeah, there we go. Um, one of my predecessors in Leicestershire, uh, Sir Robert Mark, a rather splendid quote that I use uh, quite a lot, answerable to the law, which might be important uh, in coming uh, months and years ahead, on behalf of communities, and makes us the least powerful, most accountable, and therefore the most acceptable police service. Um, and I did used to work for a chief who used to, so used to say, it's quite good that we're not brilliant at everything because it does increase our legitimacy and people empathise with that. He was probably right. That was the Dimbleby lecture in 1973, for those that care. <laughs> Consequences of transparency. Why is transparency the climate in which we're operating, whatever the landscape looks like? The Archbishop of Canterbury talking about MPs. My sense of the whole MPs' expenses issue is that what bothered people was the sense of the uncovered, that there was something going on that, as electors, they had the right to know about, and they didn't know. And, of course, then it had some visual images. I was in Hampshire at the time. We did have the MP with the duck house. We did have the MP with the trouser press. But the sense of outrage was the sense of the uncovered. So members of the public feeling, I should have known that and I didn't. And of course that's an example of the media being noble and acting as a guardian of public interest. Leveson. A different role for the media, an impact for policing, 
And I know you had some sessions yesterday, I think, where Leveson was touched on. I think Mike Cunningham uh, spoke a bit yesterday. But, but Leveson there, if there's going to be a world of transparency, are the people who are part of creating that ethical and proper and doing it properly? And I mean, I'm not going to dwell on that, and a number of you in the room I know have given evidence uh, to, to Leveson. So it kind of begs the question, well, what is out there anyway? And what is actually out there at the moment is masses of data. You can find out a lot about any police force just by playing on new media. It doesn't take much doing. In fact, this week I had a rather uh, outraged letter from a gentleman in uh, Wales uh, who had quite strong views about the fact that we had arrested four burglars and two people who shot them. Um, on the media, I was able to reply to him without bothering uh, his chief constable and say, well, this is the crime level in your area and this is your neighbourhood team and if you've got concerns about that issue, then please you know, contact them and this is how you contact them. And by the way, here's the answer to the question you raised and he brought other issues into it. There's loads of data there. But I would say that data isn't probably the same as engagement. And as an example of that, I know there's a couple of you want to grab me afterwards, I am doing a lot of work at the moment for ACPO on mental health and disability. All the guidance around mental health is freely, publicly available on the internet. It's there, it's usable um, and accessible for anybody, a service user, a police officer, it's just there but that's not the same as engagement around the data. So I think a challenge for us is, what is that engagement and what should that engagement be about? Mike was here yesterday, and I think what Mike's saying is that our legitimacy is hindered both by those few officers and staff who breach the incredibly high standards that most of us achieve, but also by the fact that there's a sense of secrecy, the same sense of the un something that needs uncovering about the complaint system. And I know that he's working uh, with Hugh and other colleagues in the room to try and change that because it will increase legitimacy, because it will increase and change the climate in which we work. Um, and I shall now shamelessly use a, a Leicestershire example around operational transparency, and I was talking about this with a colleague who I used to work with um, more than a decade ago now in the West Midlands, and we talked about some of the policing operations that we were involved in 10 years ago in the West Midlands, which we regarded as state-of-the-art, cutting-edge, inclusive. And then Op Peninsula, the EDL, and Unite Against Fascism both decided uh, the way to spend a February afternoon was in Leicester which is a fine city, I would commend it to you all. Um, how do we go about planning that now? Well, firstly, we routinely would have community mediators. And I say this not to try and give you a public order lecture, and I know others have approached this in different ways, but just think about the difference in the transparency that we're now offering. Community mediators, significant numbers, uh, three-figure numbers of pre-event community meetings. Um, and then, and I, I mean, I know the Met have used observers such as Liberty, you know, advisory group looking at all of the comms strategies. The local media actually sat in the silver control room while the operation is ongoing. Absolute, complete transparency. This paid us back on the day in terms of it helped us better deliver a safe event. It helped us explain why we were doing what we were doing and it engaged a lot of local people in an interesting debate about freedom of speech. So, for us, some risk in it, but that is the expected standard of transparency for a policing operation now. It is so far different to a world where, I mean, 10 years ago, would you routinely have had media in a control room? I don't think you would. I just don't think it would have happened. There is an expectation of transparency, and where this really paid us back was, um, there's a particular group called Netpol who came and did their observations of our policing. And they concluded that our operation was disproportionate. All of these people who'd been exposed to the operation and been in it basically said, well, that wasn't what we saw. And our legitimacy, I believe, 
increases as a consequence. So around a big structured Roman legion style public order operation, an increase in legitimacy. We've heard much about PCCs, but I think the bit in red on this is quite an interesting bit because what we don't know is quite how it will manifest itself. The successful PCC, and I, do, I, have, to, I have to do a sort of legal caveat, I'm not encouraging you or discouraging you from voting or supporting any candidate. Um, are you happy now, Irene? Is that all right? <laughs> um, you know, we'll have to swear an oath that their decisions will be transparent. Now, I think there are implications for, for, for all of us in that, probably particularly for chief officers, but also, I would say, for superintending ranks. So what is it that means that we make our decisions in private? What is it that means that we don't push them out there? And I think there's an obligation and an expectation, and we'll be working with an accountability mechanism who've sworn an oath to be transparent. Now, obviously, at the moment, we have people who are interested parties rather than candidates. But yesterday we did a briefing event for key partners which included some of the potential candidates. All of the potential candidates uh, present, they came to a briefing on uh, offender management. They all commented publicly within two hours of leaving the room about what they'd seen. Which may be Ed's point about advocacy if they're saying what they've seen is jolly good. If they're not saying it's jolly good, it might be different. Um, in the interest of transparency, the amber light has come on. That's apparently bad. <laughs> or good, depending on your viewpoint. Um, familiarity breeds consent. This is something, actually, that Nick drew my attention to, Nick Gargan. Um, social media, I think, is where a significant debate is ongoing that we should be engaged in. And at this point, I have promised to shamelessly plug the MPIA are doing 100 blogs to mark the 100 days, I think, up to their demise. And uh, you've just heard people saying about, please, can we have some contributions and thought pieces? If you haven't looked at those blogs, they're really interesting. I would say particularly mine, but there are others as well. But also, there's an opportunity for you to contribute. And the idea is there's a sort of time capsule of 100 thought pieces, some of which are provocative, some of which are evidence-based, and I would just commend it to you, and I've therefore fulfilled my promise to Nick to advertise it. But I think this familiarity that can be achieved through new media builds consent. And I'm still quite surprised that some senior colleagues aren't engaged in that. And let's just quickly, before the crook appears and drags me off the stage, let's use the Olympics and the Paralympics. There was more new media traffic in one day of the Olympics than in the whole of Beijing Olympics. Okay, huge and scary figures. Um, yesterday, athletes parades. Today, I've spoken this morning at an event about mental health. I put that on Twitter. The MP who is raising the mental health bill on Friday in Parliament responded to me and we had a chat by Twitter. That MP will go into Parliament on Friday aware of joint training of the kind that I think we should probably all be doing with my mental health hat on, that it's ongoing, and will presumably, I hope, feel somewhat reassured. So there's an opportunity there for engagement and increased legitimacy. And also, as leaders, you can check on the welfare of your staff if the button worked. Oh, I've broken it now. This is a crisis. There we go to see that they're struggling with the ordeal of policing the biggest security operation ever. Frivolous impact. That went viral last week, or the week before. Devon and Cornwall patrolling St Ives. Non-frivolous history. I think we've been operating in an environment where we've underestimated transparency. 1991, Rodney King, not a new media sensation, but a point where policing in a place was significantly changed. And I've deliberately used it because I didn't want to use an example about this country because I didn't want to, that's not the point. The point is, we shouldn't be surprised at this transparency, but we should be trying to exploit it and build on it. A couple more and I'm gone. Sorry, Hugh. I believe we are absolutely ahead of the game. 
And I used this quote from, from Sir Hugh, uh, partly to embarrass him, <laughs> and partly because he's right. We should be proud of where we are, but I do think uh, that there is a challenge for us to take it forward because my kind of equation would be being open, communicating and being accountable gives us legitimacy whatever the landscape is. Now that's different from Robert Mark's acceptability. It means that things like new media are a way of being visible. You can tell local people what you're doing. One of my, Chris Thomas is in the middle of the room there, he's just converted to Twitter, passionately committed to it. <laughs> but I think Chris, who was a bit cynical about it, and it's sort of unfair to pick on him, but I'm sure Chris will be happy to talk to you afterwards about the connections that that's already started to make. I think whatever the new landscape looks like, we need to create the climate which is about transparency and we choose to influence the legitimacy of what we do by how we approach that task. So yes, there's going to be things happening. There's going to be structures and changes and new people, but build your legitimacy using new media by being transparent and by responding to a new governance mechanism that has sworn an oath to be transparent about policing, which is a step up even from where we are, and we probably are state-of-the-art worldwide. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you very much, Simon. Could I ask uh, Derek and to you all to join us on, on the platform, please? And I might uh, come and get our, question, our microphones out and about in the hall for your, your questions and your thoughts on what's been said. Um, and perhaps uh, kick off with you, Sir Hugh, as you were quoted there at the end. Um, do you accept, uh, Simon's view, that although we may be you know, ahead of the game in, as far as transparency is concerned, the force, police force still has a long way to go on that front? Yeah, there's always more to do. Um, without exception. Um, I think, you know, as a starting point, the something the British police should be very proud of. Um, it goes to the heart of the British policing model. Um, and it's the legitimacy point that's critical to me because we, the policing by consent model, 140,000 police and falling, policing 60, what, 65 million people plus and rising, the only way of delivering is through, legit, through a legitimate police service that is recognised by the vast majority of public. So, yeah, I'm absolutely a one, if I, I, I'm sorry, I can't disagree with Simon because he's, he's absolutely right. Uh, it's a particularly brilliant quote. I don't know where you found it. You must have <laughs> made it up for me. It's very kind of you. But it is um, it's absolutely, I think, where the British model is going. That is not to say we should sit back and say this is all great, isn't it? Because you can always do more. And you have to recognise you know, that, that technology and other ways of communicating are moving on at an incredible speed. And we, are, we need to get ahead of the curve we currently are at. Yeah, what about the point that he also made, and we sort of raised its head yesterday, and that's about secrecy within the force still, particularly with regards to sort of investigations, internal investigations, and not enough openness as far as some members of the public are concerned. Do you think there's, there's room for change there too? Well, I think you can always review and change, so just looking at ACPO's sort of, yeah, we've been looking at ourselves in terms of transparency. Um, a company limited by guarantee is an uncomfortable place to be for any service that is public facing. As, um, Emily points out, you know, a transition in the, the, the College of Policing will find that difficult in the short term, but it's got a plan to get out of it. So we're looking at transparency and accountability for an ACPO with non-executive directors, you know, PCC members coming onto the board, that sort of stuff. In terms of complaints, they are slightly more complicated because, of course, individuals have rights too. And you have to balance the rights of individuals and, you know, presumptions of innocence and all that sort of stuff against the public interest. Now, there are, there are mechanisms. First, the first non-negotiable principle has to be an independent system of complaints. They can make that a lot tougher, frankly. Uh, the IPCC cannot cope with the, you know, it, it does the top end, where I came from in Northern Ireland, every single complaint from the public was dealt with independently of the police service. We had no role at all. The police ombudsman did every single bit. That is a Rolls-Royce model that costs a shed load of cash. It doesn't mm. exist, so you have to get some balance in play and recognise that the service... Is that why we don't have it? Pardon me? Is that why we don't have it? Because it costs a shed load of money? Well, well the law's different. Uh, there is no uh, the, the law around the police ombudsman, which predates Patton, actually. It was as... Um, was a result of a different piece of work, and that was a recommendation uh, um, agreed by the now devolved, which is now a devolved uh, legislation. But uh, my view, from a chief, it was a very good place to be, and I could uh, I could argue very strongly that you know, that was the right way of doing it. But it cost millions of pounds a year to do properly, um, and, and so you know, there's a financial reality around how can we put more transparency into the system. But you have to recognise and respect the rights of individuals and be realistic about the fact that many complaints 
are malicious, unfounded and unjustified. And so we've got to get the balance right. I'm looking for questions, by the way. Hands up anyone who's got them. Uh, meanwhile, do you share Ed's enthusiasm for, uh, for um, uh, police and crime commissioners? To you? To me? Yeah. Um, I think, as I, at the risk of being boring um, and non-controversial, I'm sorry, Peter, um, the role of the police service is not to dictate how it should be held to account by a government that is democratically elected. We have an absolute right to clarity. We haven't got all that clarity yet. We're working very closely with Emily and her colleagues in the Home Secretary to get it. But certainly if one looks at the obvious tensions that are going to emerge and where are they, it is the, the local and the national and, of course, P PCCs are responsible for the totality of policing. Yeah. The debates that we had with um, uh, Keith Bristow this morning, will, I think, will highlight some of it. I can see some really interesting debates around direction and direction. Uh, we have, you know, the national crime entity will have a power to direct. That is a step change in the British model of policing and operational independence at the local level, which we're going to have to work our way through. And I was saying to everybody in the margins of another, you know, of another debate, you know, we're not quite sure yet what happens, just say, the chief says no. Mm. Yes. How does that, you know, we need to make sure we have clarity around all of that. The strategic policing requirement, absolutely critical to the safety of the citizen. Uh, and again, you know, lots of work to do to get the detail. I think, you know, the fact we have a strategic policing requirement, the fact we have a protocol, are critical to the success of PCCs. Now, you know, that's great because they're in, and, and I think the work we have done puts us in a far better place to make sure PCCs hit the ground running and deliver their role whilst we deliver ours. What about, uh, just to go back to Ed, uh, before we go to our question, um, the quality of the people coming forward to be police, uh, crime, police and crime commissioners, um, and you know, a sense among some people that it's just a sort of, some of them anyway, will, some of these positions will just be sinecure for clapped out politicians. Well, I'm delighted to say the quality of a candidate is absolutely nothing to do with me, thank heavens. Um, <laughs> I, I would say, and, and it, this is not, you know, I, I, I was disappointed that uh, the Home Affairs Select Committee recommendation around chief officers were not taken up. I think it's not, I can't see, I, I don't think it's legitimate for a chief constable to be uh, a police and crime commissioner in the area he or she has worked for the four years after they have retired. I, I have difficulty with that. But, you know, that wasn't picked up. A democracy is a democracy. Anyone can stand, providing they've got the money. Yeah. But um, you see, yeah. we, you have to, we have to work with what we, what, you know, the people who are elected. That's what that's the yeah. process of democracy. I'm talking. Fair enough. But I mean, as a perception, do you, do you understand that, uh, Ed? That I mean, people see, just see this as, as I'm not going to cite any names, but I think m most people will realise the sort of people I'm talking about. Um, mm. People who've d had their life been vo voted out of power or rejected by the electorate in, in one uh, establishment are now looking to another to continue their life as politicians. Well, absolutely. I think there's going to be some surprises. We did a. Um, a poll uh, about two months ago and asked uh, the public who they'd be most likely to vote in. And you can imagine how low down the list uh, ex-cabinet ministers, uh, ex-ministers <laughs> came. I think 7% wanted, only 7% said they most wanted an ex-government uh, uh, minister and 6% an ex-cabinet minister. Um, at the top of the tree was ex-police officers, um, was local businessmen, and in some other research we did, showed they want people who lo know the local area. Now, there's quite a few independents that are standing, and there are, of course, ex-MPs, ex one they uh, obviously prestigious uh, cabinet, ex cabinet minister standing. Um, but I think the independents, and I think those who, even if they are uh, there standing on a party ticket, if they can show that they're going to be putting the public first uh, above the, uh, what their party would have them do, this is the whole point of the reform, um, are likely to fare fairly well. Okay. So I don't think it will just be full of old MPs and cabinet ministers. Sir, sir, sir. Okay, uh, Paul Symes, uh, Gwent. Uh, my question is, um, using the uh, sumo spirit of positivity, um, what is the panel's view of what the policing landscape will look like in 2020? Right, yeah, Emily, do you want to kick off on that one? You've been let off the hook so far. I'm thinking. <laughs> All right. Um, Do you want time to think? What, what, what about uh, you, Simon? Do you want to come you. in on that? Uh, I, I was accused yesterday by one of my superintendents of being mindlessly optimistic, um, which, uh, for fans of Blackadder, is, I believe, the only card that you can play. Um, it will be evidence-based. Whoops, Oops. the daisy. That's not supposed to happen, is it? <laughs> the foundations are wobbling already. Um, it will be evidence-based, public-focused, um, flexible, with really highly skilled, dynamic positive people within it. Glass half full. 
Derek, I know you've got to pop off in a minute to do a radio interview. Your, yeah. your, your, your vision of the future, uh, the changing landscape? My landscape? vision of the future is I, I, I can confidently predict, I, th I think, is that confidently predicted? Uh, but I think we will have a new Home Secretary in 2020 because <laughs> it's eight years from now. Uh, and no Home Secretary has ever uh, served that long in, in living memory. Um, and, and I'm not being facetious when I say that because there will be different politicians uh, than we have now uh, 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 in the Home Office and Government. So who knows what, the, what the, the landscape will be. But I tell you what I do know is, is that policing will still be respected and admired by the public and still be va valued by the public. And I still think the, the amazing work that police officers do on a day-to-day -day basis will still be place, taking place in 2012. And one final thing, John, if I, if, I, if I may, that people do talk about difficult times ahead of us. But even if you take the CSR spending now, we are still left with budgets of over £10.5 billion pounds for policing. We still have 125,000, 130,000 police officers. It is no use us as a service saying we cannot cope. The public expect us to cope, they expect us to lead, and they expect us to manage. And I think that will change, not change one job between now and, and 2020. OK, pop off whenever you need to. Uh, gentleman here, tells you, sir. Peter Holden, British Transport Police. And a question addressed to Ed around PCCs. Uh, I was greatly encouraged uh, regarding your view as PCCs as advocates for the police service, particularly in relation to, if you like, putting pressure on partner agencies because um, it's not within the police's role to cut crime uh, without the help of partners. Uh, the sanction for PCCs in terms of chief constables is quite clear in terms of dismissal. I'm interested in your view on what sanctions PCCs could bring to bear on other agencies and partner agencies who don't respond to the promptings. Sure. Um, to begin with, I think they'll have two things. They'll have media and they'll have political clout. Um, how things change uh, over the coming years and leading up to 2020 um, may well affect that. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, 15th of November goes well and police and crime commissioners come in to see them have a, a wider view across the criminal justice system. Um, but I think first and foremost, beyond that, um, for them to have the legitimacy to do their role well to represent the public, they're going to need strong local voices. And hopefully that pressure, when they come in, I'm expecting that pressure to be enough to actually move some of these inculpable problems that are there at the moment. Simon, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think in all the debate about police and crime commissioners, the and crime bit is the bit that's sort of been forgotten. Um, it's all about sacking the chief constable and doing this and doing that and the other. But the, actually, the and crime bit is probably where the greatest opportunity is. Um, you know, uh, you know, at the risk of sounding like a politician uh, from the Liberal Party who wants to go forth and prepare for government, you know, go back to your force. What, what are you doing to prepare for it? I mean, I'm not saying we're perfect. We've actually merged the LCJB with the Community Safety Board and when the PCC is elected, we're going to say to them, would you like to chair this group? Around the table, by the way, you've got the head of probation, the chief constable, the chief executive of all the different councils, um, all the agencies that do the and crime bit and who work together very well now. You know, what sanction have they got, I think, was the question. Well, one of the sanctions is money for some of them uh, because they will have the pot of money and you know, withholding the budget for some things. Um, and I think they will increase the accountability of others because they will probably talk publicly about some of these issues. I mean, it's a sort of transparency point again. They will talk publicly about some of these issues and what are the options and how can problems be solved and, f and kind of act as a, as, as a catalyst for that discussion. So I think the and crime bit is, is hugely underplayed at the moment. OK, I've got a question over here. Someone, yes, sir. Hello, Ian Wiley, Avon and Somerset. Um, I welcome the transparency agenda, but one of my concerns uh, is the unintended consequences, which is the huge growth in FOI requests. Um, and it's becoming a bit of an industry, certainly in my own force, taking a huge disproportionate amount of time. Um, for my own small department, for example, generally a member of staff written off uh, a day per week servicing FOI requests, which are generally from the, uh, the media. Um, what's the panel's view on how we should manage that? Do we just continue to uh, accept this and uh, put up with it? Um, uh, I guess a couple of points quickly from me. I mean, I mean, firstly, I think the media use FOI as a tactic so they can say, I've made an FOI request and give a sort of a bleak hint that if they just asked you, you wouldn't have told them in the first place. I mean, we had a cracking example of that on Friday. How much has a particular policing operation cost? 
Well, we told the MPs and we told the local council. We then got asked by the local paper. My FOI advice was, well, no, you should make them make an FOI request. And I said, well, why? Why don't we just tell them this is what it's cost? Um, you know, are we really going to make them fill in a form? Because it's something that FOI is going to tell us we probably can tell them. It, is it, yes, it's about a policing operation. It's not dreadfully contentious. So I guess my challenge would be, you know, Firstly, a relationship with the media, which is if you want to know something, well, ask and ask through the proper channels and ask through the comms team. Um, and secondly, I, I sometimes worry about all these things we've got that can only be revealable by FOI. Um, we go to so many jobs, we arrest so many people, we get this many detections, crimes up or down, this is public confidence. You know, what are the things that would really hinder us if they are within the public domain? And there are some things um, and we should deal with them properly around that. But I, I kind of worry about that sort of climate of FOI. I think it's partly about relationship with the media and it's partly about, well, what's going to be out there anyway? I mean, have a play on the internet and see how much you can find out about your force. You know, your accounts are on there, the names of half your people are on there, your neighbourhood teams are tweeting, telling everybody where they're on patrol and what they're doing. Um, so I would sort of, I think we have a role in that. Um, because I, you know, I don't know that FOI is the answer to everything. I mean, how many of the FOI requests that we get, wouldn't we actually have answered it if we'd been asked with a microphone by Radio Bristol, I presume, or whoever you enjoy being interviewed by? So the answer's in your own hands, is what he's saying, to, to some degree. To an degree. extent. Yeah? Yes, sir. Yes, thank you, uh, Chris Rollins from Leicestershire. Uh, just one point on the FOI before I ask my question. Um, I guess I agree with the Chief that the more you publish... On, on your websites, the more you've actually got out there, the less requests you get coming in. So it's a bit of a sort of circular argument to a certain extent. Uh, my question is in relation to the College of Policing, and uh, it was interesting to see it's going to have a responsibility for good practice. And of course, we get good practice at the moment from HMIC, we get IPCC reports coming in, a huge amount of stuff comes into police forces almost on a daily basis. Do we see that the College of Policing is going to somehow? have an overlay of that because I think that would be really helpful in terms of forces trying to go forward and improve policing. I think if the College of Policing is doing its job properly, it will be taking on HMIC and the Home Office and, and pointing out, and IPCC, pointing out the times when we've over-bureaucratised, when we've um, forgotten that professional discretion needs to be put at the heart of things. So, yeah, I hope the College of Policing will be challenging back on some of that. Can I answer the question that I ducked? Yeah, by all means. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to, to, it's always dangerous for a civil servant to speculate, but it strikes me that the, in, the creation of police and crime commissioners is in a sense a very anti-home office thing. It will be very difficult in future for the home office to reinvent what it did um, under the Labour government, which was to have direct uh, targets. Um, and be performance managing police forces because there'll just be a raft of politicians turning around and saying go away so i think in eight years time that will be even stronger that the, the home office just won't be able to get in the way in the way that it used to and it, it, we're sort of designing into the system an expectation that the home office will not be um telling you how to fight crime um the other thing that i i think will be a choice for governments going forward will not just be should the pcc be chairing meetings but should the PCC have more of the budget? So, you know, should it be commissioning more of the probation services? Should it be commissioning more across the criminal justice system? And actually what we've created is a, is, um, a, a, a person, an individual, who has the potential to think across a system and think more holistically. It will be a choice for government. They may not choose to take it. OK, I'm sure you'd like to thank our panel. Thank you very much.